أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدى لو لا انحدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله نبي المهدى محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن والاه رب الشرح للصدر وأسر لأمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي صدق الله العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Our dear uh, brother Fairuz from Thailand who is the chairperson of our session Our respected brother Dr. Imtiaz uh, Zafar as the executive uh, director of the training program My dear brothers from uh, different parts of the Muslim world Alhamdulillah uh, I'm uh, I feel so happy and thank to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has given us his uh, bounty as well as uh, giving this opportunity to meet you in a very special program as to fulfill the request from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعِلَ اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ So, again, uh, I am very happy to participate in this uh, program. I think this is for my fifth uh, involvement in this program. And thank to Brother Dr. Imtiaz and other brothers in making this program very effective and also as a process of learning for myself and yourself. So our topic today, inshallah, will be on Islam and modernism. I think this topic need to be comprehended slowly, gradually, because I do not want to make it uh, too academic because we are involved in the field of dawah yet we need to know this because of one of the greatest challenge that we are facing today is the onslaught western challenge to the muslim world in particular we must say that events after 11 september of 9 of uh, 2001 has indeed uh, giving us an uphill task to understand the challenges of the Western civilization. In that, I mean one of the basic questions is the issue of modernism. The word modern itself, perhaps you may have followed it in Webster Dictionary and other dictionaries or encyclopedias, but uh, briefly, I think the general acceptance of the term modernism, it is more or less very much related to the nature of Western ideology, which is also part and parcel of their struggles against their own religion, namely Christianity and Judaism. As you know, in the middle path of Western civilization, there was a great rebel among some uh, learned uh, uh, clergymen who want to question the nature of universe, the question of nature, the nature of uh, creation, the nature of knowledge, and uh, they were indeed unhappy with the authority of clergy because they cannot question and they cannot get the satisfactory answers from their religious authority. So as a result of that, there was a continuity of, or a continuous of uh, unhappiness on their part and uh, this has brought to the, what it is called the age of enlightenment 
or the age of Renaissance. And they were very much involved in scientific uh, uh, endeavor, what it is called today, romanticism. Or in other words, they were defining the nature of knowledge as totally uh, <coughs> depart from religious authority. So more or less, the idea of modernism must be related with Western ideology, which is uh, related to the question of secularism, meaning that to part religious belief system institution from the domain of uh, authority. Nothing has to be related to the question of life. It is also meant for materialism because people see that the question of matter is very important in the Western civilization. The question of spirit or spirituality, the question of metaphysics, you know, you know metaphysics, something uh, uh, beyond our perception, the real thing is uh, untouchable, is uh, was important anymore. So the notion of modernism then, it uh, very much relates to this question of uh, materialism, as well as the third uh, nature of uh, modernism, it has uh, to relate to uh, continuity of investigation on the nature of uh, scientism. Or in other words, a kind of uh, continuous effort to search the truth through scientific endeavors, which they believe that they can reach the truth. Modernism also can be defined as a kind of uh, adopting or adapting to the changing of time, passage of time, because of the uh, human development in science, in technology, in the context of progressive uh, materialistic uh, efforts and so on. These are the general apprehension or the general conceptions of uh, modernism in the West, where for them it is a must because they confine religion only to spiritual. Religion for them is only on Sunday. Huh? Religion, religion for them is only for burial. Huh? Even uh, marriage is considered no more sacred. It is more in uh, civil marriage. So this is what happened in the West. So now I'm coming to the history of the so-called uh, modernism in the Muslim world. In the Muslim world, it has started in the 19th century. And you know that as a result of the Muslim world have been colonized by different uh, colonies, the French, the Italian, the Spaniard, the British, the Portuguese, uh, the Americans, uh, and so on. Countries like Egypt, for instance, figures like uh, Napoleon Bonaparte has brought the idea of why Muslims should modernize their religion their way of life, their thinking. It has a very great impact in the life of Egyptian intellectuals, learned society in Egypt. People like Rafa'i Tahtawi read a lot of great Western modernist writings 
like Comte, Rousseau, Herbert Spencer, Charles Darwin, and so on. And followed by great Islamic scholars, even a product from Al Azhar at that time, like Sheikh Muhammad Abdu, the author of Risala to Tawheed, the author of uh, Islam and uh, Christianity and Civilization, Al Islam, Wal Madaniyah, Wal Masihiyah. Even he went to Paris with Jamaluddin Al Afghani, and they managed to author one great uh, volume of journal, they name it Majalla al Luthko, which is a carbon copy of great Western uh, literatures on modernism, on Western civilization. People like Taha Hussein, the great novelist in Egypt, 100% carbon copied the idea of why we Muslims must uh, leave only religion for specific matter, but rather than to copy down from Paris, from London, uh, the whole uh, literature of Western, uh, great uh, writing of Western people. So they came through colonialism, and they have their people there to perpetuate the idea of modernism. As you know, also in Egypt, they sent uh, Lord Cromer as one of the great advisors in the educational institution over there. In the Malay Archipelago, two great modernists, one from the Dutch and one from British, played their role. One is that in Indonesia, known as Snok Hagronji, a well-known author who wrote a book about the Mecca and the pilgrimage, yet he influenced the Dutch in making the educational system in Indonesia uh, to be totally westernized and secularized because they know that Indonesia has majority of Muslim population. In Malaya, now it is Malaysia and Singapore, they sent Stamford Raffles. In fact, there is a book written by one uh, Malay scholar in Malaysia, Stamper Raffles, was he a reformist or a schema? The answer, of course, he was a schema. When he visited a Quranic class in one of our provinces in Malacca, the country where Portuguese colonized, there was a Quranic class over there. And he was accompanied by one particular person by the name of Abdullah Munshi a person like myself, the Indian blood origin. So he asked students over there, Stamper Raffles, what did these people learn? And the answer was they studied the Quran. To what extent they studied the Quran? Were they only studying Tajweed or were they also deepening the understanding of the message of God? Of course, the answer both. So he put a remark and then the, uh, made a kind of special meeting in order to bring the reform in the madrasa system, what it is now becoming a hot issue after the 11th September, the recurring of the continuity of the modernist in the Muslim world. So I have shown to you, I'm sure that in Africa, yeah, they must have after the legacy of Othman done for you. So this is the history of uh, modernism in the Muslim world. I have uh, showed to you some main figures, uh, like Jamaudi al-Afghani, Rafa'at Tahtawi, Sheikh Muhammad Abdu. In the South Asia, the Indo-Pak subcontinent, of course, names like uh, Sar Said Ahmad Khan, was a celebrity to the Western people. Maulana Abdul Kalam Azad in Pakistan, P. 
people like uh, the Mufassir, uh, I forgot his name, uh, uh, Iqbal, one of them, another one now, I forget. Uh, I have the name, I just, uh, uh, Parwes, Gulam Farwes, yeah. He's a famous Pakistani name, <laughs> how, how should I forget it? Yeah. Was a celebrity, uh, as well as the latter part of uh, this uh, uh, Indo-Pak continent figure like uh, Fadur Rahman. But in Indo-Pak continent, we have a lot of Fadur Rahman. Huh? But this one is the Fadur Rahman who is uh, known as uh, new modernist. In fact, he accepted uh, people uh, and he himself uh, called himself as new modernist. So these are figures, uh, my dear brother, in the Muslim world who are making the uh, effort to modernize the way of understanding Islam. The message is to reinterpret Islam through reason rather than to be through revelation. Or in other words, they do not like to see that our interpretation of Islam based on the traditional approach, namely from the Quran and Sunnah and other authentic thought of accepted ulama. Of course, this is a very uh, tough subject. Uh, people make a lot of PhDs and master programs, uh, this program, so uh, we are trying to simplify it in order grasp the general conception of modernism. So now I'm coming to this substance of this issue of Islam and modernism. What are ingredients in this so-called what they term as Muslim modernist or quote and unquote which is disputable Islamic modernism. Uh, to look into that matter, uh, let us go first briefly on Muhammad Abdu from Egypt, or it is also known as Mufti Muhammad Abdu. Uh, Abdu is very much uh, emphasized on the importance that Islam is always, he said, in consonance with reason. His theme is that Islam, Deenul Aqli, religion of reason. But unfortunately, although the Quran speaks about reason, al-aqlu, and our mufassir have settled the question of aqal because it has very limited role, though it is a great uh, bounty from Allah to all human beings, yet Abdu seems to be unhappy with the nature of Muslim backwardness because he claims that our backwardness in science and technology because we neglect reason. Our interpretation of Quran excludes reason. We just follow and became ourselves as muqallid to the authority of ulama in the interpretation of the Quran. You follow me? Yeah. So he is objecting strongly to this business of the so-called tafsirul Quran bil Quran, to interpret Quran with the Quran, tafsir bil ma'thur, like the tafsir of Ibn Kathir. The highest position in tafsir is the tafsir of Ibn Kathir. Of course, he entertains the tafsir as Zamakhshari, because the approach of Zamakhshari is Mu'tazila. You know Mu'tazila? Uh, one of the madhab in al-mukalab uh, which is uh, imposed or which is uh, I mean very much emphasized on the approach of reason so for him religion uh, reason is the end has a religious orientation all the way and for that matter he tried to 
reform Al-Azhar University, but he failed. He tried to bring uh, sciences subjects like physics, like psychology. But the problem of Abduk, he became a kind of sheer follower of Western modernists without any critical position on these subjects. I will give you an example for that, like in psychology. He wants to impose modern approach of psychology by Freud. You know Freud? Oh, Freud. Freudism. <coughs> Whereby we know that Freud is anti-religion. is a rebellious to his own tradition, Christianity. And we have our Quranic position on ilmu nafs, our maqamat, our levels of insan. Very clear. But he became a kind of Apologetic, huh? apologetic. They call in Arabic yata'afa, uh, yata'afuna. Uh, became apologetic of the Western disciplines. He liked to bring this to Al Azhar, and the ulama of Al Azhar oppose it, although they respect him of his knowledge, no doubt. He tried to bring the idea of evolution of Darwin. Nazariya at-Tatawr al-Insan. You know, the Darwinism of... Uh, yeah, yeah. Very, very unacceptable from the Islamic point of view. Because the idea of that this evolutionism is a natural process it is uh, because of uh, man determination rather than by the upper position, namely God. He want to bring that kind of subject in Al-Azhar, so ulama oppose it. This is why he failed in the reform of Al-Azhar. And Al-Azhar maintained as it was in the past, as it is, inshallah, in the future. You know what is the latest development which I read from Majalla in the Arab world? I just came back from Cairo. So now for the first time, Sheikh Al-Azhar Tantawi, he expressed his shockness that the American authority came to Al-Azhar now and instructed Al-Azhar to reform the curriculum of Aqaid, Aqidah subjects, Sharia subjects. This is what has been done by Muhammad Abdu 50 years back, but he failed. Alhamdulillah, the answer of Tantawi was indeed very firm. He said, there is no way for you to interfere our affairs. This is belong to the Muslim affairs. So because they know that Al-Azhar is one of the important centers for the true Islamic learning. So, uh, in other position of Abdu, uh, another point of him, he adopted Kamte, one of the founders of modern sociologists from France, what it is called Comtean model of the evolution of societies. To start with, with natural existence, social and political. Meaning that man civilization, according to Comte, based on this natural existence. Second, social environment, which afflict the further growth of uh, modern society. And finally, the role of political apparatus, the political masters who shape the modern civilization. So again, he is uh, involved in this kind of uh, model, mm -hmm. which is against the Islamic position as it is revealed in the Quran. Hmm? You know that uh, in Islam, we have a concept of what it is called marching time. What does it mean by marching time? When Allah created us, beginning with Adam alayhi salam, uh, وَنَفَخَ فِيهِ uh, رُوحِ uh, 
then we will continue until we will come to the end of this world and we will uh, resurrect again in another world. Yawmul Qiyamah. But these people, Comtian, the modernists, they don't believe in that. For them, there is no more other world. They only look for this world. More or less, our learned scholar Abdul, although he claims that he still believes in that uh, day of judgment, in the day of Akhirah, but in a way, somehow or other, he became apologetic in accepting this kind of model. So, what did Abdul say? His famous uh, uh, quote, quotation, man was by nature a rational and a religious animal. This is a Comtean. Man was by nature a rational. He's very much uh, uh, emphasized the importance of al-aklu to every individual and a religious animal. Using the word religious animal. So it is a kind of submission to the notion of Western understanding of man. So this is in brief. I have uh, other evidences to show that Abdul was a modernist when come to the issue of Sharia, to the issue of political institution, the question of Shura. He doesn't accept the notion of Shura as an effective political instrument. He is totally in democracy. When it comes to the issue of women, al mar'a hmm? when it comes to the issue of education, he always emphasized the importance of fardul kifaya rather than fardain. Religious education, he said, is only for an elite. No need to disseminate for so many people. But for the fardul kifaya, the natural sciences, because these are indeed vehicles for Muslims to revive, it is very, very important. But he didn't discuss about the Islamicity of the disciplines, rather than just accepting them as they were before. Uh, Sir Said Ahmad Khan from India. What are some of his modernism thought? He denies the existence of spiritual world. He denies the existence of spiritual world. For him, spirituality is not so much important. Even he questions number two, position of malaika, angels. And he put angels as natural faculties or natural power rather than a special creation of Allah. And even to link al-malaika as God's attributes, means sifatillah. He condemned the existence of jinn and he called them as savage nations or uncivilized primitive people of the world. Very, very harsh expression. This is Quranic. Huh? And so on. Number four, Satan, Shaitan, as the animal nature in man. As the animal nature in man. Number five, he denounced the bodily mi'raj of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He denied the bodily mi'raj of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. 
of course, among ulama, there were some discussions whether Prophet Muhammad went to ascension either bodily or spiritually or both. But his position, of course, is uh, very much rational. Number five, number six, of, number six, yeah, rejects miracles of all the prophets of Allah. Rejects all the miracles, mu'ajizat. And he considers miracles were merely events which happen in accordance with the law of nature. And uh, there were no specific miracles that can be proven scientifically. So, in summary of his thought, Ahmad Khan, when it comes to the issue of all these al ghaibat unseen, always want to relate to the, always want to interpret it differently from the consensus of Mufassirun. He always put it that all these creations, they are natural by themselves, rather than to be uh, specifically uh, to educate us to say that we have to believe this because these are min al ibad unseen. And this is part and parcel of iman, min al aqaid. He doesn't want to come to that kind of expression as put by ulama in the past. Another interesting uh, view of uh, Ahmad Khan as well, he doesn't believe in Adam as the first man on earth and no as prophet of Allah. For him, Adam salam, actually means human race. On the understanding of Al-Wahyu revelation, again, he is also bound to modern interpretation, very much uh, influenced by science, try to relate Al-Wahyu of prophets to the position of biological interpretations. Uh, meaning that, it is not purely from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it is also somehow or other uh, played by man's uh, biological uh, instincts, like wujdan, wujdan in Arabic, uh, instinctive of uh, human being, al-wujdan. See, it is not purely al-wahyu as it is defined by of as you know that revelation in Islam it is kalamullah al-munazzal antariq uh, al-jibril alayhi salam to prophet muhammad to all the prophets including prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam he didn't want uh, to accept that kind of definition but rather to have a new alternative to relate it to man's biological uh, nature. For him, another interesting uh, analogy, he who discovers the laws of nature and, and uh, who invents a machine, all are recipients of, the, this, of this divine revelation. So it is a kind of accidental rather than to be fixed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to determine somebody from mankind that uh, could become uh, God's uh, messengers. No, for him it is a kind of uh, everybody uh, can make it, can receive 
revelation uh, as if it is a kind of uh, robotic uh, uh, way of uh, making something through the natural process. So, um, and finally, prophets for Sir Said Ahmad Khan were only spiritual and moral leaders. Spiritual and moral leaders, rather than they were indeed uh, as the uh, special messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all aspects of man's living. So he confined the definition of uh, prophethood only to recipient of moral as well as spiritual. What they call this kind of interpretation, this is what in English, in the academic uh, jargon, they call it reductionism. To reduce something, there is an ideology in the West to become reductionist, from the word reduce, reductionism. This is also one of the characters of uh, modernism in Islam. They reduce, like the complete uh, understanding of uh, prophethood, as it is uh, accepted by Jumhurul Ulama, they reduce it. They accept what they like, and then they didn't accept what, what they do not like. Because they believe convincingly, according to them, that it is irrational to accept everything which have been interpreted by ulama. Uh, you must uh, remember one book in history by Muhammad Hussein Haikal, uh, Life of uh, Muhammad. He didn't put the one section about Mu'jiza, miracle of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as well as the Mi'raj of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is one of the examples, uh, a kind of modernistic approach in writing life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In order to present to the Western world that Muhammad was indeed rational, eh? not having a kind of uh, something uh, irrational in his uh, uh, way of life. Because for them, uh, stories like Mu'jiza, I'jazul uh, Quran, uh, all these are irrational in the mind of Western people. When come to Ijazul Quran, Ijaz, what does it mean by Ijaz? Ijaz the the miraculous part of the Quran based on the supremacy of language. Ijazul Quran. Huh? Nobody can compete the uh, beautiful language of the Quran, which is hundred uh, percent is uh, kalamullah rather than a creation by man. For him, it's not important when we talk about the uh, Mu'ajizah or Ajazul Quran because he said that uh, there is a verse in the Quran uh, where he said that the word Ajaz is only to show that it is a guided book to mankind rather than to prove that it is uh, indeed a very unique uh, uh, book which has been revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He equated this guided book, Al-Quran, like Torah. Torah also, he said, has uh, language beauty in it. In fact, Quran also does speak about the uh, language beauty of the Torah. So why we would uh, speak a lot, hmm? discuss a lot about the yeah, al Quran? Now I come uh, to another figure in uh, Indo-Pak subcontinent, Ulam uh, Farwes. Briefly, Ulam Farwes, the author of Tafsir, he completely rejected Hadith as the second source of Islam. And he said it is 
a man-made religion, hadith. Totally unacceptable. And all these are irrational in the mind of Western people. When come to Ijazul Quran, Ijaz, what does it mean by Ijaz? Ijaz the the miraculous part of the Quran based on the supremacy of language. Ijazul Quran. Huh? Nobody can compete the uh, beautiful language of the Quran, which is hundred uh, percent is uh, kalamullah rather than a creation by man. For him, it's not important when we talk about the uh, mu'ajizah or oh, ajaz al-Quran because he said that uh, there is a verse in the Quran uh, where he said that the word ajaz is only to show that it is a guided book to mankind rather than to prove that it is uh, indeed a very unique uh, uh, book which has been revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He equated this guided book, Al-Quran, like Torah. Torah also, he said, has uh, language beauty in it. In fact, Quran also does speak about the uh, language beauty of the Torah. So why we would uh, speak a lot, hmm? discuss a lot about yeah, Jazz al Quran. Now I come uh, to another figure in uh, Indo Pak subcontinent, Ulam uh, Farwes. Briefly, Ulam Farwes, the author of Tafsir, he completely rejected Hadith as the second source of Islam. And he said it is a man-made religion, hadith. Totally unacceptable. He ridicules, ridicules the concept of Jannah. Ridiculing the concept of Jannah. Making it a kind of joking, a kind of absurd. There is no Jannah. It is only metaphor about the question of uh, uh, laban, asal, honey, milk, yeah, rauda, garden. All these are metaphors. It didn't exist, according to him. And he said that people are misled by the figurative language of the Quran and failed to capture the true meaning of what God described in the Quran. Jannatun tajri min tahtihal anhar. He said that we are not understanding the word anhar. We have a kind of metaphor. Uh, we have a kind of real meaning of anhar, uh, whereby it is only metaphor for him. And as a matter of fact, he said that all these uh, beauties in the Jannah, we can get it in the world. It is what he termed it for test for test of men during their life. And uh, strangely enough, Ulam Farwes also is very much influenced by social revolution as a result of Maoism, Marxism. And he interpreted the verse of this uh, Quranic uh, ayah, in sa'ata la atiyatun la raiba fiha, walakin akhtharan nasi la yu'minun, meaning that it is a victory for mu'min in this world when they are staging revolution after the failure of Marxism and capitalism. Subhanallah. This is a very, very uh, gross uh, uh, mistake in terms of Aqidah. But I have to tell you this because uh, it has been also studied by many people uncritically. As people also didn't know that exactly uh, the mistakes of Mufti Muhammad Abdu in the discussion about Wahyu, Nubuwa, uh, and some other related issues on Al Aklu, Al Wahyu. Whenever we study it from time to time now in universities, it, becoming, it has become 
uh, are very tangible, very clear in front of our eyes that Sheikh Muhammad Abdul was very much apologetic and modernistic in his approach of Islam. Now, before I come to uh, uh, the effects of modernism in the Muslim world, a lot of effects, a lot of implications have affected the mind, psyche, as well as the nature of Muslim societies. Number one, some intellectual Muslims became confused of the true meaning of Islam. And they were easily condemning ulama all the way as anti-modernism, anti-developmentism, anti-progressivism, and so on. They belittle the role of ulama. They belittle, I mean, making uh, their uh, position little by little. And they thought that their way of interpreting Islam is much more viable because they understand what it is happening in the West. Although we do not deny the fact that there are some ulama who might be in the traditional schools do not understand what is currently happening in the world today, particularly in the field of science, technology, economy, and so on. Yet, these ulama, they are the two defenders of Islam, of the Aqidah. But these Muslim modernists, I don't think they are the preserver, the protector of Aqidah anymore. They let people became, become confused. As a result of that, you see in Egypt, the emergence of Egyptian intelligentsia, people like Qasim Amin, Ahmad Amin, talk about Tahrirul Mar'a, liberation of women. They condemn hijab and jilbab. This is why a modernized Muslim societies like in Egypt, particularly in the 60s and 70s, in the time of Jamal Abdul Nasir, they were very secularist, very secularized. But now, alhamdulillah, with the rising tide of Islam, you can see now in Cairo city, more and more hijab and jilbab in the Arab world. Yeah? In Indonesia, in the 50s, totally Western uh, lifestyle, the Dutch influence. In Malaysia, so this is one of the results of uh, the so-called Muslim modernist, Muslim reformist. Qasim Amin uh, wrote a book, Tahrirul Mar'a Fil Islam, Liberation of Women in Islam. In uh, the Maghrib countries, the emergence of a writer like Fatima Marnisi from Maghribi. She is a celebrated figure now, totally uh, condemned hijab and uh, jilbab. And now, the conflict between West and the Muslim world in the media, the question of hijab and jilbab huh, uh, is becoming uh, a very controversial issue. And recently, in our country, uh, our neighbor, Singapore, the issue of uh, school uh, children putting hijab yeah, in the national school became another controversial issue. See, this is as a result of uh, criticism of Muslim modernist to traditionalist approach of protecting the Islamic identity like hijab and jilbab. The question of riba. In Pakistan, the Padr Rahman made a very great controversy during the time of Ayub Khan because he justified the present uh, riba is not uh, the real riba which prohibited by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And his notion of family planning and the protest of ulama of Pakistan in 1965 
to throw away Fadur Rahman from Pakistan and let him uh, settle in USA and became professor in Los Angeles and Chicago until he passed away over there in the last seven or eight years. Yeah? And he wrote a book, Islam and Modernism, and he wanted to reform the madrasa system. He attacked one of our failures. He said that in the traditional system of madrasa, our tafsir Quran is very much backward. And he said that we Muslims need a kind of new interpretation of the Quran. Everything he said must focus on the Quran, although he still believes in hadith. This is Fadr Rahman of Pakistan. We have a lot of Fadr Rahman here. Fadr Rahman Ansari, this is Fadr Rahman of Chicago, they call. Yeah. So these are, yeah, I'm coming to the end, inshallah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, inshallah. Uh, uh, one of the effects, uh, for example, in uh, novels in the Muslim countries, particularly in Iran and Egypt, depicting the idea of Western uh, Freudism, huh? the position of Western psyche. Nothing whatsoever from our novel, novelists in the Muslim world to depict the idea of Quran and psychology. They do not want to discuss about position of nafsul mutma'inna, nafsul lawama, nafsul amara. They deny it. They just want to bring the, what it is called psychoanalytic, psychotherapy. Even in Iran, a famous novelist by the name of uh, Sadiq Hidayat killed himself, suicide, because of his psychological suffering. This is one of the remarkable uh, evidences of uh, wrong understanding of Western conceptions of psyche. Okay, my brothers, yes? Sadiq Hidayat. Sadiq Hidayat. So my dear brothers and uh, my dear brothers, I think uh, uh, we come to a uh, conclusion because I still have some points, but then the, uh, we want to entertain time for question and answer. So let me stop here and we can continue during our discussions, lunch time, dinner times. I understand that we are going also to Lahore, so in the caravan we can have chit chats about <laughs> what is happening. <laughs>